zero. So for those of you at uh, Facebook Live, somebody asked, his, somebody's girlfriend is mad because the guy wants to be a millionaire and she doesn't want that. Um, and so we're, we're answering that question. So you have to try to rephrase it in a different way. So instead of telling her, I'm going to be a millionaire no matter what, go to her feelings, go to where, what she's thinking and where she's coming from that and be like, it's okay, it's not about being a millionaire, it's about you know, being stable in our life. You know, We want to have a great home to raise our children and blah, 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 which implies you eventually might be a millionaire. So now, I don't know why somebody would be mad that you want to be a millionaire. That's kind of weird to me. So, you know, I don't want to make you break up with your girlfriend, but I'll be like, that's a red alert in my brain. You know, if I ever met somebody, it's my wife's there. If I told my wife, do you want to be a millionaire? Are you mad if I tell you we want to be millionaires? She's like, no, of course not. Who doesn't, who wouldn't want to be a millionaire? You know, it's, now, if you're sacrificing everything in your relationship with your girl to try to be a millionaire, then I can understand her point of view. Then she could be like, I don't care about money, I, I care about you. And because you're just so focused on being a millionaire, you're forgetting about me. Wait, this is cutting my head. There we go. You're focused on me, you're not focused on me or our family or whatever, then I can see that and you don't want to do that. Remember, this talk is about the pillars of life. Health, love, um, wealth and happiness. So you have to balance everything. Um, now, if she's saying she doesn't want to be a millionaire because She's just a hot-headed and has no reason for it. I tell you, red alert, you're not married. You'll find one that, I'm pretty sure you'll find one that would love for you to be a millionaire. So, let's go to the next topic. Let's start with the four pillars. We'll talk about health first, okay? So health, is very important, as you may all know, okay? You need to do exercise. I don't wanna be cliche here, but you have to work out and you have to eat well. Those are the two most important things for your health. Now, this particular topic, sleep, is very important and it's something that everybody forgets about. You know, you don't hear or you don't read many articles, you need to sleep better, you need to sleep more. You don't hear people talking in the bus you know, you hear people say, oh, today I did 250, 250 pound squats and this, and I worked out and I ran in the morning and I did this. You don't hear anybody saying, oh, today I slept eight hours, it was awesome, my body feels great. It's a topic of conversation that people neglect. Now let me ask you this. We sleep 33% of the time we're sleeping. So imagine if you were 90 years old, that means 30 years of your life you slept. That is a lot of time, wouldn't you agree? 30 years, if you're 30 years old, you slept 10 years of your life, and if you're 21, seven years, so imagine right now I tell you, you're 21 and I tell you, okay, you have to sleep, or, or 14 and I tell you, you have to sleep seven years in a row until you're 21. That's a lot of time. Now the question is, why do we sleep that much, right? And, and, and just to put it in perspective, sleep is so important that back when we were in the caveman times, we sacrificed our lives and risked of being eaten by a lion or a bear or a tiger by sleeping, right? So you hide in your cave and you're like, it's sleepy time, I'm going to sleep eight hours, hopefully no bear is going to come and eat me. So it is so important in our life that evolution did not adapt and say, hey, we're not gonna sleep that much because we have high chances of dying, of being eaten, or being attacked and killed by our next door tribe. No, you still slept. Everybody, our bodies need so much sleep. Horses need about, I think, two hours of sleep. Some animals need less, we need more. So the point here I'm trying to make is, you need to start focusing on sleeping. And why? So I did an experiment, okay? And I'm gonna show you why sleeping is important too. I'm gonna tell you physically why is it important, aside from aging. 
Now, most people say the average person sleeps about eight hours, which is true. The average person sleeps about eight hours. But there's people that sleep five, there's people that sleep ten, and that, you know, and that is what it is. And there's nothing you can do about it. In my opinion, people should sleep as much as they need to sleep. So I did that experiment with myself. I did it with my nephew. He's not here right now. But basically what happened is my nephew was sleeping eight hours on the clock every day. He would go to bed. He would set his clock, sleep eight hours every day. But I noticed when he was working with me, he was at, in North Carolina with me working at the park. Every day he was tired. We would get in the car and he would fall asleep. We would go back home, he would fall asleep. He would be working and be like, you could tell he's tired. I'm always tired. I'm like, Alejo, why are you always tired? You sleep eight hours a day. You're 18 years old. I'm like, why in the world are you still tired? It's like, I'm 40 years old and I outdo you, you know, and it's embarrassing. I should be the one falling asleep on the wheel, not you. So, what I told him, I said, do this experiment. Because I think your problem is you're not getting enough sleep. He's like, oh, but I sleep eight hours every day. I'm like, yeah, you know, some bodies like myself need more than eight hours a day. And there's nothing you can do about it. You're... Your body decides this is what you be you, this is your genetics, this is how it works, and that's what happens. So he did for a week. I said, what you're going to do, you work for me, so don't worry about schedule. We're going to go to bed, we're going to wake up at any time we want, okay? And that's what he did. And guess what? Within a week, he was never tired again. He was always energized. He was always ready to do more stuff because now... His body, you know, so what ended up happening is he needed about eight and a half to nine hours a day. So when you're sleeping eight, eight hours a day and you need nine, what happens is, so you sleep eight, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. But well, let's say you need nine, so here you have one hour, two, three, four, five, six, you have seven total hours of sleep debt by the end of the week. And that's why he needed naps and, and, and all of a sudden, so there would be one day where he'll sleep like 12 hours, you know, of the week. It's because he was owing, uh, there was sleep then. And those of you who say, oh, I need sleep, if there's a myth that goes around that says you can't, any sleep you lost, you can't recuperate. That is not true, okay? And if you don't believe me, see it for yourself. Every time, don't go to sleep for two, three days in a row, and you're going to see that the next following days you're going to want to sleep way longer than what you normally do sleep. And that tells you right there that you are sleep deprived, that you do have sleep debt. So my nephew was getting about five to seven hours of sleep that every week that he wasn't catching up to. Now, it's, let's say you do have a job where you can't do anything about it. Then every day there's half an hour of debt you can't really add it up and say, oh, 365 times half an hour, that's like 150 hours of sleep debt that I have, I'm gonna die. No, it doesn't work that way. You, you owe, when you recuperate, you don't recuperate maybe all seven, but you might get back four, okay? Um, because there's other reasons why your body wakes up that we're not gonna cover here. But the point is, it is extremely important. It is extremely important. So I tell you, and everybody that's watching, I encourage you, sleep as much, as much as you need. Another way, let's say you can't do it because you do have to get up at 8 every day and you can't go to bed at a certain time at night. Take naps. Take a nap. You know, my wife, she's sitting there and she loves taking naps. I'm not a nap person, but she likes taking naps. And actually today, I'm sure she's going to take a nap because yesterday she didn't sleep. Through. She's going, yeah, right. Uh, yes, she will. Oh, uh, because yesterday she was sleep deprived because we went to a movie late and today she has to get up and take the kids to school and whatnot, so she didn't sleep much. I actually slept five hours today, like today, which, so I am sleep deprived. But eventually, I'll catch up with it. So the point is, make sure you sleep enough. Why do you want to sleep enough? Now, before I move to why, Stimulate. Some people, especially those of you in college and trying to study and getting forward and, and, and trying to save time, you start taking caffeine and stuff, you take drugs. That's just a cheat. You're not saving anything. Yeah, you're getting more alert and more energy, but you're still not catching up in your sleep and that's still deteriorating your body. Okay? 
This is stuff that happens when you don't sleep. It's been shown, scientifically proven, for the one person that says that I'm not a, neuros a good neuroscientist, uh, toxins accumulate in your neurons. So your brain cells accumulate toxins, right, during the day. When you go to bed, a lot of, there's spinal fluid that bursts out from their spine, goes into your brain, and helps clear these toxins from your brain, from your neurons, from your brain cells. If you don't sleep enough, guess what? You don't remove all the toxins the way you're supposed to. And you know what happens if you have too many toxins? You start getting damaged. You have cellular damage. When you have cellular damage, many things can happen. You age faster, cells can die, you get sick, you get diseases. Is that what you want? All because of sleep. Energy depletion goes down. Of course energy depletion goes down because when you fall asleep, this is when your body regains all its energy. So if you start accumulating sleep debt, then your body starts uh, reducing the amount of energy you have. And as much as you think you might have it, see, some people tell me, oh, when I wake up, I don't sleep, but the next day I wake up and I'm so energized. If I have an exam, well, you might have other reasons why you're energized. You might have, like for example, when I was taking exam when I was sleeping, when I was sleeping, I was like, uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. Somebody was showing me something. Um, yeah, when I was taking exams, when I was sleeping, the next day I would go to bed very late because I was studying, right? You're cramping at the end of the, the, the day, trying to study the last thing. It was five, six in the morning. You go to bed the next day, your exams are nine in the morning. And then you go and you feel so fresh when you go. But it's because adrenaline's in your system. So you're taking an exam. But then what happens is once you take that exam, your body goes, Ugh. and you want to go to bed, you want to take a nap. Your brain starts malfunctioning. Right, and if you there's a, there's studies that have been done. Well, first of all, they did studies on rats where they show that after I think three weeks they die after they deprive them from sleep. And then this is one of the most important ones: aging accelerates. You become older faster. Okay, and what I mean is biologically older, not chronologically, but biologically, your body, the ends of your chromosomes called the telomeres. Right? I don't know if you guys ever seen a chromosome, but if you haven't, the ends of the chromosomes, put a picture there on the guys of a chromosome and telomeres. The telomeres are an indication of how fast you're aging or not. That once you lose all your telomeres pretty much, or when you start reducing them, that's when you're aging. So your aging accelerates considerably, considerably. Is that what you want? Do you want to take years out of your life by just not sleeping? It's as simple as just sleeping more. And yet, we don't pay attention. Look at this study. And for those of you who have companies, this is why this is so important. They did a NASA study. And they put people 26 minutes to sleep, take naps. All right, so right there, that's a chromosome. You see, it looks like an X and the ends the tips, I know you guys can't see it, but the tips of the chromosome are called telomeres. And when you are rep replicating the DNA, it gets shorter and shorter with time. So if you have DNA damage and whatnot, because you're not sleeping well, because you have deficiency in vitamins and whatnot, those things shorten faster. Okay, thank you guys. So, they did a study in NASA, 26 minute nap the productivity of employees increased and their attention. I mean, sorry, this was, there's two studies, I'm gonna tell you. The NASA one was, they tested pilots, if they do a 26 minute nap, their attention and focus increases by 34%. 34% attention, okay? That's a lot. That's like saying, you know, if you have 100 units of attention, I'm taking 30 away if I'm not sleeping well. There's other studies that they've done where they show that students that don't that take naps, and I think these were 17 to 20 minute naps, increased their productivity. Uh, not students, employees at, a com at companies. They increased their productivity by 40%. 40%. You know what that means, guys? If you own a company, that if you make 
$100,000 in your company and you increase productivity 40%, you will make $140,000. Now imagine you have a company with hundreds or thousands of employees and you can increase everybody's productivity by 40%. What would that do to your company? So what do we do? At, see, everything we say, we preach here, we do. So at the Knowledge Society, you know, we have a sleeping room. We have a room with little, what are, they're not beds, what do they call those? Bean bags. Bean bags, futons, whatever you want to call them, for our employees to take naps in the middle of the afternoon. If they feel tired, they can go and take a, four, a 20 minute, 30 minute power nap so they can regain their acti uh, brain activity levels and be focused and uh, be more successful. And we don't do that just to be cool or to copy Google. We do that because research shows us that. Research tells us that, hey, if people don't sleep enough, they're not productive enough. So do you want to have none productive? Actually, where's Artie? Yeah. Come here, Artie. He doesn't want to go. Okay, Artie, he's shy. Artie was working two jobs. It, it, like six, seven, before I hired him as a GM, he was working two jobs. He was working for me. Uh, uh, in the registration and he was also working as a general manager at a restaurant and then I noticed Artie started getting tired he was very ineffective employee for a few months because he was overworking himself he wasn't sleeping enough he was working seven days a week about how many hours Artie? yeah he was working 80 hours a week no rest so what happened is I saw a very huge decline in performance, you know, which I remember telling him, I'm like, take a weekend off once in a while. Eventually, I was able to hire him full time and only work for me, so now he doesn't have to do that. Now he works 40 hours a week like a normal person. But the point is, because of that, you know, his performance declined. So imagine you have 10 employees that you're overworking every single day, like our poor video guys here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sometimes they are overworked, you know, when we do seminars and stuff, there's sometimes you have to, there's no way out. But the key is to give people time to recuperate. Yeah, yeah. and it's meant, oh, 100%. If you break through that first day, like, I'm good. I can go, I can go all week. Yeah, you can go all week, but the truth is you are decre decreasing your performance. So, before we move on to the next topic, let me see what's the next topic. Oh no, we're going to continue. So, we were talking about aging. So, most people don't see aging as a normal process of life, which it kind of is, right? But I encourage you, and this is kind of our new thing now with time, with part of our programs, the nutrition and health programs. If you start looking at aging as a killing agent, imagine aging is a disease, right? You're not, it's not part of life. Like, if you treat aging as a disease, where you can cure it or, re or, or retract it or slow it down. Wouldn't you want to do that? Wouldn't it be something you would want to do? Where if I tell you, I can add 10 years to your life in the future or five or seven or 17. Wouldn't you want to do that? I'm sure your answer is of course I do. So that's what you have to do. You have to treat aging as a killing agent. And the way you do that is you do you say, what causes aging? And we're not going to be talking about aging today. I'm just giving you a little example. And the next time I give a talk, I'm probably going to go more in depth about aging and what all the different many factors like vitamin deficiencies. 70% of Americans are deficient in vitamin D. Deficiency in vitamin D causes um, accelerated aging. You know? So stuff like that, but don't worry about it. Okay, it's back, I think. Yeah, it's back. The way you eat and what you eat influences your age. And what I mean is your biological age, and that's measured by the telomeres. And biological age means, so chronological age is the age you have. You're 15, you're 20, you're 30, you're 50. But the thing is, are you a 50-year-old that's going to last 20 more years, or are you a 50-year-old that's going to last 10 more years? So that's your biological age. Okay? So you could be a 50-year-old that has the biological age of an 80 year old, which means you're gonna die a lot sooner than a 50 year old that has a biological age of a 40 year old because he's so healthy. And that's what you wanna achieve. Um, you wanna eat healthy, 
And the one we were just talking about for a while, you want to sleep. If you don't sleep, if you don't sleep, I told you, it accelerates aging. And a very important other one, stress. Being stressed all the time is not good for your body. It accelerates aging too. It activates a whole bunch of pathways that lead to DNA damage and reduction of telomere size and whatnot and so forth that you're not going to get to where you want. So part of the program that we're developing with Ty is, you know, we want to help people add life. Right? And how do we achieve that? Educating you, telling you the stuff we're telling you right now. If if I get 10 people that are watching out of the thousands of people, if I get 10 of you to listen and do what I told you about sleeping, I know I'm going to multiply that aging, that biological age by a factor of years. And our goal is to be able to add ye millions of years to people by educating you guys. So I'm going to move forward. The next one is love. But before we do that, is there any questions about sleep? Tony Robin only sleeps four hours a day. That's bad for him. Sorry to tell you. How old is Tony Robbins now? So we have Tony asking if melatonin, taking melatonin daily to help sleep. It's good? Yeah, taking now don't overdo melatonin, but it's good. You can take melatonin to help you sleep better. Okay. What? Blue blocking sunglasses. Yes, blue blocking sun black sunglasses are good. The problem because what happens is blue light alters your circadian rhythm. So the Swannies, you know, where James Swannies sometimes on these light bulbs and he sells these great uh, uh, glasses, they are effective. It's, it's, a, it's a true. So you want to have some orange light or some light that doesn't really affect the way. The, these are the Swannies. And again, I'm not trying to sell. These are not, I don't make any money by selling James Swannies uh, glasses. But I do highly recommend them. They actually look cool. They kind of work too. Like I've noticed a difference. Like sometimes I'm kind of manic at night and I stay up all late. But if I have these on, I kind of mellow out a little bit. Yeah, you do mellow out because, like I said, it helps you. It, it once you block those blue waves, right? It helps you sleep better. You want to block all the blue light. You want to have orange light. If you want to, if you want to be on your iPad. Um, now another th something we have in our house with my wife, we have our night table lights are orange. So if we're not watching TV or we're not on our iPad and we're just reading a book, that's all you need. You don't need the glasses. But if you're going to be on your iPad, you're going to be watching TV, put the glasses. You want to block that blue light because you want to reset that clock. Okay? And then, again, in the new programs, we're going to be talking a lot more about this kind of stuff. Um, somebody asked, does it matter what time you sleep at, Ramon? Yes and no. No, I will say yes, and I'll tell you why. If you go to bed every day at, say, um, noon, right, or 6 in the morning and you wake up at 8 at night, so let's say you're opposite, you're in the, hello, let's say you're in the opposite cycle of sleep. Sleeping-wise, it's okay, but the problem is now you're not taking certain, like, for example, you're not exposed to the, to the sun, and I just told you 70% of people are lacking vitamin D. And vitamin D is produced in our bodies by exposing yourself to the sun. So you have to be careful. If you are going to be, if you are sleeping at night and never awake during the day, make sure you take the right supplements because it's going to mess you up in, in general. So, and again, I will, um, I will um, cover a lot of these topics coming up in the future, in the near future. Um, I sleep all day, stay up all night, so there you go. So that for Eric Major King, make sure you take supplements to, to be able to like take vitamin D and take anything you need for, to overcome that. Uh, six to six, seven hours is best oversleeping. Is oversleeping bad for you? Kind of, because what happens if you oversleep, you're, you get all drowsy and your body is like, it's out of sync. That's why I don't like taking naps, because when I take a nap, I want to sleep 20 minutes. I want to sleep like two hours, but then I wake up all droggy, 
and like tired. I'm, I feel like more tired. So don't do that. It's not. It's not going to hurt you. It's, nothing's going to hurt you. If you you can sleep more than less. Okay. If you don't sleep enough, it's going to hurt you. If you sleep more, you're not going to be hurt. Not, you're not going to die. You're not going to get older. Um, but you're not going to be as productive too. <laughs> Oversleeping, same as undersleeping. No. So that hopefully answered your question. Any other questions? Um, ta -da -da -da. Okay. Oh, somebody's asking about Rhonda Patrick. She she's a great. Um, she actually specializes in vitamin D and stuff like that. So, yes. So I highly recommend. Um, highly recommend you guys look her up. I don't, I'm not sure she wrote any books. But I know she there's a bunch of lectures, so great, great scientist. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Love. So we talked about health. Now we're going to cover love. And who doesn't want to know about love? Now I'm not going to cover love in the sense of relationships. That's going to come again. <clears throat> Somebody's asking how much before I move into love time should we spend in the sun each day as much as you can now this is why I recommend everybody do go get tested for vitamin D deficiency see how deficient you are and then choose accordingly you know you need to be a lot in the sun you have to take some vitamin D um, on your own unless you live in a tropical island and are outside all day you're not gonna get enough part of the reason is because the way we live we we come from our cars, which are blocking the sun, into a house, which is blocking the sun. Go to work where it's blocking the sun. We go shopping to sh places where it's blocking the sun. So most of the day, we're not getting exposed to the sun. So you want it now. And then going out to the sun for like 30 minutes a day is still not going to make you less, uh, you know. Uh, it's going to make more vitamin D for you, but it's not going to be enough. So you're going to have to take supplements. Anyway, so let's talk about love. And particularly, I want to talk about the power of sex, and and why this. The first time I heard about this was in a book called "Think and Grow Rich" from uh, Napoleon Hill, and it was a great book. It's one of my first books that I read about, you can say, self-help or motivation. Motivation, and it was interesting <clears throat> because there was a chapter. I think it was chapter eleven called sex permutation. Just so you guys get an idea of what the power of sex means. And, and this is all stuff ingrained in your brain. Because the purpose of any species in the world, and this is going to sound very biological, is to maintain the species, right? If we don't have sex, our species doesn't go on. So we're evolutionary conditioned to want to have sex. And it's like one number one thing in our life is we're conditioned to eventually have sex. All our fears, everything we do is conditioned so that we can have sex. It all leads to that success, money, everything so that we can have sex and make babies and continue the lineage of human beings, right? Because animals that don't have sex eventually die off or animals that have problems conceiving or it takes too long for them or you know or when the, the mother dies but the baby stays whatever it is they eventually evolution eventually gets rid of them and to illustrate how important how powerful sex is I mean sex is the most powerful in my opinion sex is the most powerful driving force known to humankind so, let's say you, I, actually I'm going to give an example of a, of a true case. This was the dean of Rockefeller University in uh, New York, so one of the most prestigious universities in the country. About 22 Nobel Prizes came from that university. So this guy was the dean, the director, whatever you want to call it, the president, CEO of the school. So as the dean, he was probably making, say, $300,000 a year. Let's just say he had a net worth of $5 million. He was married. 
had two or three children, let's say two, had a reputation, right? I mean, you're the dean of a very prestigious university that, that has a reputation, right? Now, this is before, and we'll say after. And after was, he was caught on camera by another student kissing a student at a bar. He kind of got a little bit drunk. Some other student was flirting with him. They made out. And another student took a video of that. It went all over the place, of course. And what happened to him? He lost his job. His wife left him. Now he has to split 50% of the time with his children. Hopefully he got 50-50. Some guys can only get the weekend. But let's say he got 50-50. His reputation is gone. And his fortune is half now. Right? Now, think of this. Two people making out. They didn't have sex. It was just make out. Now, maybe they did have sex afterwards, but the point is, what got him in trouble was a kiss, was making out with a person. You lose a $300,000 salary, a $2.5 million, um, $2.5 million from your fortune. Now you don't have the love of your life. You don't have your spouse. Now you get to spend half of the time with your children and you have no reputation or it's ruined by media and people saying you're an a-hole for doing that to your wife. So the key is, is it worth it to cheat, to do that, or not? Now, I'm sure he knows it wasn't worth it, and everybody that's watching here can say, definitely not worth it. But what happened? It was the power of sex. Those genes in your body saying, we need to mate to produce more babies from other lineages, from other women, so that you can have your genes spread out. Kind of like Genghis Khan, he had about a thousand kids, right? So almost all of us probably have some sort of genes of Genghis Khan in our DNA. The thing is, it is extremely important. It is extremely powerful. So the key is, how do you use that to your favor? How do you make that driving force work for you instead of against you? Because that definitely worked against me, against them. I'm sure if I did that, my wife is watching here right now. She'd be like, I don't want to tell you what she would do, but she would be like another Lorena, what was it, Lorena Bobbitt? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, and the brother-in-law. It's like, I get brother-in-law. See, I would lose... Everything I have for a one minute passion, you know, it could be one minute. I mean, think, it's like, to me, it's like, sometimes I think about it, I'm like, one minute of my time dedicated to something can lose me everything I worked all my life. Who is the biggest, uh, Tiger Woods, right? Tiger Woods lost, how much was it? Can you Google that? How many, how was the settle, the divorce settlement for cheating? It was one of the largest settlements in the history. How many? Hundred million. That's it? I thought it was more. But still, a hundred million. One hundred million dollars he lost because he cheated on his wife. That is not pocket change. I don't care who you are, okay? So you need to harness that power of sex and use it for Better your, to better yourself. One person that did that very gracefully was Napoleon Bonaparte, right? When he was conquering the world, he stayed by his, the side of his wife. He used that energy to help fight and be successful. If you, this is the other thing. If you become monogamous, and I know a lot of you that are watching, I'm young, and it's like, screw that, I want to go around and have fun. And, get as many girls and ladies as I can. When you're young, it's okay. It's okay to have fun, you're developing yourself. But eventually, you wanna be stable. Because what happens, I'm gonna tell you something. When I was dating a lot, before I met my wife, way before I met my wife, 
uh, I was dating a lot of girls, right? And I would go into these dates. Like, I remember sometimes I'll have three dates in one day, okay? Three, there's Napoleon, there you go, he's the man. Three dates in one day. My energy and my money and I, was, I didn't have much money, I was a student back then, was going down considerably. Because if you go, think about it, if you go sometimes to three days or two days or every other day you have a date, well, you're trying to impress the girl, so you're gonna take her out to dinner, right? You're gonna go to the movies, you're gonna go play something, you're gonna do something fun, so money is just going out. And then your energy, your energy, goes out because now you have to be on your best behavior because you're trying to impress the girl girl again so you're holding your farts you're, you're doing whatever all these weird things that you normally don't do with your girl you go out you you know you be, act you know you become this awesome gentleman whatever every single time you go on a date and your energy goes down and then on top of that is the energy of like the lies you might come up with if you're dating multiple girls or multiple guys now you have to make up stories on your head so the point is you got all this energy and money coming out it's not stable for you it is not it's like so what you do is you become stable that's why most people eventually get married because it's better. Then you have a partner in crime with you. You have somebody that now you split things twice. Instead of you doing everything and spending all the money and energy, now you have a person with you that can help you help you grow and be more successful. Does that make sense? And here's another stats. Married men make more money in average than unmarried men. Okay? And, and another stat that I didn't put here, but married men... Huh? Yeah. Well, the, yeah. Okay. My brother-in-law just got divorced, unfortunately for him. Not all the time. Now, you don't want to be married and be unhappy, too. I'm talking about if you're married with the right person, you're stable, you're happy, you guys get along, you have the same goals, you share ideas. There's Keep that, because it's going to make you stronger. Okay? What? Yeah. My brother-in-law agrees. He just found the wrong person. She was a... She was an evil Knievel. <laughs> but you know what? My brother, my personal, my brother, not my brother-in-law, but my brother also married a, a person that was pretty evil. I'm like, okay. Now, how do you maintain these relationships? How do you, um, how do you do this? How do you become more, Ty should, okay, Ty is coming very soon, guys. About 30 minutes. I still have like four hours more of talk, hmm. but we'll cut it when Ty comes. Oh, one of the things is, do you guys know what emotional IQ is? And for those of you who don't know, I will explain it, but emotional IQ, so there's the intelligent coefficient, the IQ, that everybody knows, you take some exams, you do this, you do that, you're successful, um, you're good at math problems, you get an IQ. Well, I'm, I'm not a big fan of IQ, okay? Part of it is because I think it's skewed, not skewed, but it's kind of biased. Because if you put an artist on a mathematical IQ, he might not do as well as a mathematician. But the artist might be way smarter, in my opinion, or, or, or in general, right? But emotional IQ, is an, it's emotional intelligence. And what does that mean? It's like using the power of you, observation, and understanding yourself and others helping yourself put yourself in other people's shoes and understanding them to better that relationship, to get a benefit and a goal for yourself and for the other person. So for example, to increase your emotional IQ, you can do something like being empathetic. Being empathetic is very important. Whether you're in a relationship with a loved one or you're trying to sell something, if you are empathetic, and I don't have time to tell my wife's dentist story, but if you are empathetic, you will sync with people a lot better than if you're not. And by being empathetic means putting yourself on the other person's shoes and say, what is this person trying to tell me? Or, or how would I feel if I'm doing that, if I was on the opposite side of the spectrum? Right? That is being empathetic. <clears throat> Be humble. Okay? Be a humble person. If you're humble, your relationship is going to grow. You're going to be much better off. 
evaluate yourself, okay? So not always criticize or tell on the other person or tell the other person is wrong or what not. Look at yourself and say, am I doing something wrong? Am I being the one wrong here? Apologize often and my wife's going, uh-huh. I actually have a hard time apologizing. Not that I don't want to apologize, it's just that it's just it, it's hard. Even though I need to apologize sometimes, I might think it, but I might not tell her. She's nodding her head like, mm-hmm. Um, be flexible. Okay, everybody's different. So don't expect everybody to be the same or act the same way or react the same way. If you're not flexible, so you have like I have two children, little guys. I'm not 100% the same with each one because it's impossible. Um, and the reason is because they're different personalities. So I have to treat one a certain way sometimes to get it to him or to get to his head. And the other one I have to treat a different way. The same way you do with your coworkers, your friends, your different people, you have to be understand. You have to understand that you have to be flexible, that you have to let people know. Um, and then be adaptable. So you have to, it's just like you're flexible understanding, you have to adapt too. You have to be able to know when, uh, what's the word? You have to adapt to them, to fit, to, so like come down to their level sometimes I say. You know, so if I'm talking to a person, look, if I'm talking to a low level employee, let's say, and I don't mean low level in a bad sense, but a lower level, I will go down to their level, adapt to them, see what they're doing and try to reason with them at their level. If I'm talking to a CEO of a multi-million dollar company, I'm gonna try to adapt to them and try to understand and see what they're doing. Does that make sense? And then take time to think. Make sure you think everything you do. One thing that I do, for example, when I'm mad, and let's say somebody pisses me off, and then what I do is I write a nasty email, because right then you're angry, you know, you're reptilian brain takes over, your rational brain shut down, and you just want to like curse them out. And So what I do now, and I've been doing this for years now, I write a nasty email. And then I wait and I say, if tomorrow, 24 hours later, I still feel the same way about what I wrote, I send it. If I don't, I rewrite it or I don't send it. And I found 95% of the time, I don't send that email. Or I completely change the whole email and I calm down and I'm much more calm. So make sure you take that time to think. So let me take some questions now. Why isn't Ty Lopez married? You can ask Ty. <laughs> um, how long did I miss? Somebody said, how long did I miss? We've been here for two hours and 15 minutes. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm a good guy. Thank you, Victoria Arnstein. Uh, I would like to know where you stand on vaccinations. You need vaccinations. Vaccinations save the world from death. So I am not opposed to vaccination. I'm opposed to taking drugs for everything around there. You know, you have a headache, you have this, you have that, you take pills, pills, pills. I don't like that. I'm very against taking too much medicine. But vaccinations are a different animal. You need to have vaccinations because a lot of people would die if, without them. So, uh, the university rules is irrelevant. Never work for a bad organization. I don't know what they're trying to say on that one. Okay. Is this currently still live? Yes. Stephanie, we're still live. Uh, Ty's coming in about 10 minutes. Um, can you summary two hours and 15 minutes, please? <laughs> um, I will summary in a minute, okay? I'll give you guys, but just so you guys know, we, we've been talking about the pillars of life and mainly, um, and we talked about creativity. People need to be creative. If you're not creative, you're not going to be successful. Uh, we talked about goals. You need to set your goals short and specific. If you set them too big, it's too stressful for your body and your brain, and you're not going to achieve them. If you're fearful, you have to be careful. And what I do is I work backwards. I 
backward engineer fear and I basically start from what's the worst that can happen to you. So if you look at it that way, then we talk about sleep, uh, a little bit about health from the four pillars, and sleep was uh, our main topic because people disregard sleep. They talk about diets and exercise and this and that, but they never talk about sleep, and sleep is very important. Uh, and sleep, if you don't sleep, it accelerates aging, you have, you have toxins accumulating on your brain, you slow down, your net is effective. Um, then we were talking about this last topic, which was the power of sex and how married men make more money and how uh, having a more stable relationship um, gets you closer to that stable four pillars goal. Okay. How do I balance my business with love life? It's, it's very easy. I don't know why people struggle with that. The key is, if you're in a business where you're working you know, 75 hours a week or 80 hours a week, as long as your partner understands that that's temporary and you're doing it to get to a point where now you can achieve independence, that partner should be supportive of you. But if you're doing it for the next 10 years, don't get mad when that partner is like, I don't want to be with you anymore because you're never around because all you do is business, business, business. So make sure you know that. I think, and my wife can say that, in our life, I, I work hard enough, she works hard enough, but we don't work you know, 90 hour weeks where we can't do anything else. We really, we have a good balance of work and then spending time with the family. This weekend we went with Ty, I mentioned earlier, to Palm Springs, um, and they came with me, my wife and my two kids, and we had fun and we hung out. It was good. All right, let's move to the next topic. We, so out of the four pillars, or my three circles, where was it? I don't know where it went. Don't forget about the happiness equation. Yes. All right, it's right there. I was going to remind myself. Here. So out of all the pillars we have of life, we have love, health, wealth, and happiness. We talked about love, health. I should talk about wealth and then happiness, but I'm going to talk about happiness and then wealth because that way we can link it to Ty's topic. So we're going to talk about happiness first. Now, there's actually a mathematical formula that's been produced by mathematicians that if you follow this formula, you'll be a happy camper for the rest of your life. So I'm going to move this slightly so these guys can see it too. Ta -da -ta -da. Uh, I guess maybe, maybe not. Can you guys see it? So there. So for all of you, all of you who are wanting to know how to be happy in life, this is what you have to do. And can you minimize it a little? There's. We're trying to rescale it. So there. W0 plus W1 is the sum of gamma T minus J C R plus W2 and the sum of blah, blah, blah. That is this formula for happiness. Did you guys see the formula for happiness? Okay, thank you. Okay. you thank you very much for the formula. Do you guys have any question about the formula? If you apply that formula, you'll be happy. <laughs> that's all you have to do. See, we're scientists here. So that, that's what we need to do. Any questions? Yeah, there you go. I'm so happy now. <laughs> Somebody's like, I need to write it down. No, it's not a joke. It's not a joke, okay? It's not a joke. The happiness formula exists. It's a mathematical equation taking into consideration certain things. You can Google it. If it was a fun project that some mathematicians did. Um, but the truth is, even though there is a mathematical formula, this is what people want and what makes them happy. You can take the formula out now. Um, I was just trying to be a little bit funny there. I'm not the funniest kind of guy. But this is what people want. People want wealth, health, love, and happiness, right? Well, when they did a world statistical survey, the lowest score on determining people's happiness was wealth. 
uh, the, the lower score on what people want in life, sorry, not in determining happiness. So when pe there is a survey, a world survey asked thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, and they say, what do you want, what would you want in life? What, if, if you could ask something from life, what would you get? So the lowest score was for wealth, health and love tied, you know, but the highest one was happiness, right? People really want to be happy, you know? Being rich is good, being in shape is great, you know, having somebody to love you is awesome, but the truth is we all want to be happy. And yes, you do that by combining all these. This is very interesting too. This was from, uh, you can Google this too, there's a World Happiness Index uh, report that comes every year. It's a very through thought study. Um, the top 20 countries in the world. So there's 151 countries. There's 151 countries that are involved in this study. Out of the top 20, 12 are from South America, believe it or not. 12 countries from South, and I'm, so, and I'm proud of that because I'm from South America. 12 countries. USA is number 105 in the report. Okay, that is very low. That is very low. So that means, in general, Americans are not that happy. Okay. Now people always ask me, well, does money make you happy or not? And the answer is, yes and no. Sometimes it makes you happy, sometimes it doesn't. Ty is coming. Okay, so we still have Ty's coming, he got delayed. You got bathroom issues. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so I'm gonna do a chart here. This is <clears throat> uh, income. So say zero to a hundred million dollars or a billion, whatever. And this is happiness. Can you guys see that? You guys see the chart? Okay. Now, a lot of people think that that's what happened. Some people think, oh, money does not make you happy at all. It, it's, it's not involved in happiness. But science has shown the following. Okay? Money affects happiness to a certain level. So, and this level, which is about here, from here to here, you could say, in the US is about fifty to seventy thousand dollars a year. Okay? And why is that? Most people are unhappy. Like if you are poor, now and this is for a married couple by the way. If you're single, it's a lot lower. Right? And if you don't believe me, ask a whole bunch of people that I know that are single that are making twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, and they're perfectly happy. They have a good relationship. They have, and what happens? But this is why. There's a certain point in life. As long as your basic necessities are met, and a little bit above that, not just basic, basic. But let's say you have a, a car that you're content with. You have your house with your family. You make a decent amount of money where you can take vacations and go out and buy certain treats and things you want. That, as long as that is met, you're happy. Anything below that, you're less happy. Doesn't mean you're not happy at all. But you could be right here, you know, you could be in a, a family making say $35,000 a year, and you're happy, you're content, but you're not as happy as you could be if you were at 70. Once you reach that number for an American family, it plateaus. And they show that people that are making 70,000, the families that are making $70,000 a year are just as happy as a dude that's making 100 million, 50 million, 5 million, 2 million, right? Because what happens is after you reach and you get your basic necessities taken care of, everything else that comes is BS. It's like, I want a boat now. I want a Ferrari. I want a bigger house. I want to go to France every month. I want to do, you're right? 
And it's not stuff that's meaningful for your life. And it's stuff that's temporary. So the, the curve really looks like this when you get richer. It's like this, and it goes, meow, meow, meow. Right? And these peaks are like, Ferrari came in. And then a boat. And then a big house. And then I uh, tickets to, I don't know, uh, to go see somebody famous. And this and that. So what happens is, yeah, you get a little jolt of happiness when you buy something new or something cool. But you immediately come back to your basal level of happiness, which is this one right here. So the truth is, so now, let's go back. So people ask, so then what really truly makes people happy? So there's five main things that people are happy with, okay, to make sense of their life. One of them is to be active. And active, you know, exercising, working out. If you are a slob and you're always sitting down and eating chocolate and ice cream and you never get out of your house, you're going to be, tend to be depressed, which is the opposite of being happy. So you need to be active. If people studied active people versus non-active people and their happiness levels, are, it's a huge difference. And I don't mean you have to go to, I hate going to the gym. Right? I hate it. I just, I don't know why, but I hate it. But I love playing paintball or running around or playing with my kids or doing stuff. Now, I do work out, even though I hate it, but I work out because I know what the benefits of working out are. But the point is, be active doesn't mean go to the gym tomorrow. It means be active. Go walk, you know, around the block. If you're old enough that you can be running and lifting weights, it's okay. You can walk. Ty's grandma is 98, I think. Yeah. She walks every day. Every single day she goes out on walks, has a little walk, and she's sharp. She beat me a backgammon. I was so embarrassed that a 98-year-old woman beat me a backgammon. But you know what? She has 98 years of backgammon experience that I don't have. So, but the point is that she was sharp. She's still so sharp. You know, if a 70-year-old guy beats me a backgammon, I'm like, ah, he has experience. But a 90-year-old, I'm like, I'm thinking, they're all going on the other way now. They, they shouldn't be as sharp. But this woman is very sharp. Very, very sharp. She still plays chess as well. Okay? Take notice. Embrace things around you is another thing. So be mindful of what's surrounding you. You know, if you're going out, like we went this weekend to the Palm Springs. We, you know, me and my wife went for a walk. And then also Ty and the other boys, we went for walks. You're walking. You're looking at your surroundings. You're looking at nature. Um... They say that walking, they did a study where people did walks through cities and walks through nature trails. Happiness levels way higher when you're walking through nature tra trails. Same walking speed, same everything. You know, it's still exercise, even running. There's actually a TED talk about a guy that did the study where um, he's developing an app in Europe, I think, where they're doing bicycle courses so you could let's say you want to go from point A to point B and he tells you so you want to go from point A to point B he tells you which route is the most scenic for you to go on your bike to give you more satisfaction in life which is a pretty cool app if you ask me so those cyclists because in Europe it's very 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 common to be cycling everywhere there's bicycles everywhere so this guy is developing an app I think it's French um, and so it, it asks you, do you want to go route A, which is like the shortest distance, but you're going to go through the city, or you want to go route B, where it's a little longer, but you're going to go through this thing, and you're going to see, go through this park, and you're going to see the Tower of London, and you're going to see this, blah, 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 whatever it is, and it makes people happier. So taking notice of your surroundings and being aware of them is very important. Instead of driving, if you have to go somewhere, drive around the area that's nicer, you know? Keeping an active mind, keep learning, keeps people happy, you know? Being curious, uh, feeding yourself with new information and new things to learn also has been shown to keep people happy. This one's very important too, giving. Giving to people. And it doesn't mean just you're going to donate $1,000 to a charity. You know, giving anything. You can give knowledge to people. You can give people attention and your time. You can give so many things. You can give, yeah, you can give to charity as well. 
Uh, but giving has been shown to increase people's happiness. But out of everything that makes people happy, happy, the one and most important thing. Somebody said Tower of London. Tower of London is in uh, England, isn't it? Yeah, it's a it's a bridge in England called Tower of London, right? I don't know why I see some, somebody's asking that. Uh, so the point is, oh, what's the number one? Actually, I'm not going to flip the page. I want to see who can answer that. What's the number one thing that can make people happy? If you can post here. What is number one thing that makes people happy? Drugs. <laughs> that is funny. Anybody? Facebook. Somebody put it? Refresh the Facebook one. Oh. Come on, somebody. Love. Friends and family, friends and family is close. Smiling, love something, gratitude, love themselves. Okay, somebody, uh, relationships, that's close too. Very close. Oh, there, somebody answered it. Okay. Meaningful relationships. Okay? That's the number one thing that makes people happy. Connecting with others and having meaningful relationships. Okay? It's the number one thing. Think about it. If you're 80 years old, do you want to be by yourself with all your fortune, your health, and your workout abs and whatnot, but then have nobody to share anything with? That's not true. There has been a study, for those of you who doubt me, there's been a Harvard, it's a study from Harvard University. It lasted about 75 years. They actually passed on generations of scientists to continue the study and follow up. And they studied, I think it started with 800 people. And they found that the happiest people were those that ended up with meaningful relationships when they were in their 80s and 90 years old. So, for those of you who are married, so, so somebody said relationship, that's why I say you were close. It's not just relationship, it has to be meaningful. Because you can have a relationship with your wife Right? You're married, but you hate each other. That's not meaningful. You're not going to be happy. You're going to be miserable. You can ask my brother-in-law. Right? Um, so, that's the number one thing. Now, somebody asked... Um, the, the talk here is about um, eight hacks of marketing. That's what Ty's going to talk about. Yes. But I told you, you might have come in later. We're going to talk about the four pillars of life before Ty comes in. And the number four, which is, well, that's why I said I'm going to leave it to last so I can link it to the seven, eight hacks of marketing for people. So, does anybody have any questions about uh, this that I've discussed earlier before we move into the last topic, um, which is wealth, which is what most of you are here for anyways. Um, I guess the dean is not happy. Yes. Ty is coming on in about 15 minutes, according to what they, the last time they told me. Uh, no stress life makes you happy. Yes, stress helps you. If you're stressful, you're never going to be happy. You're stressed all day. Real love. Don't get me wrong, guys. When I say meaningful relationships is not the only thing that will make you happy. It's the most important thing to make you happy. Love will make you happy. Wealth like I showed you somewhat of wealth can make you happy. But um, started with man, they included their spouse and children. Cool study. Yeah, somebody read the study. It is a very cool study. I recommend it. Type in the Harvard study of happiness and you can see, you can read. Um, anybody else? Uh, you have the same accent as Thai? Do I? I don't think so. I, I'm, I have a Hispanic accent. He's like American. He's an American. 
Um, you're good, right? You want to talk? Yes, I'm good to talk. Okay. All right, let's move on to the stuff most of you really like, which is wealth. So I'm going to start with, I have a whole list of topics that we can cover. And you guys can stop and kind of interrupt me and ask me questions. Let's see what's up here. We're going to talk about the fourth one. So remember, we talked about love. Well, I mean, health and happiness, which is in the middle. And now we're going to talk about wealth. Okay? <laughs> Can you guys bring this up in the video? What does that mean? I don't know what that means. Uh, yeah. uh, go over long. Okay. Now somebody's saying this talk is so long, covering so little. So little of the topic you're interested in. But there's many topics. For those of you who just joined, and I'm going to repeat this. Every time we have a live call, we have a speaker ahead of time. Today it's me another day somebody else, and so on and so forth. So everybody talks about different things. Because remember one thing, there's not one person in the world, not one, that knows everything. So I know you're expecting Ty, and Ty's coming, but Ty doesn't know everything, okay? So if he doesn't know everything, he can't teach you everything. So take advantage, ask questions. You don't have to ask me any questions, but you can ask questions. Every time you have somebody else teaching you something different, um, who did we have last week? There was oh, we had a few guys. Justin Senior. We had yeah, so we had. Tan. I was away, so I didn't see. But we had a whole bunch of guys that have a whole bunch of different knowledge, um, and you have to take advantage of that. You can always pause and come back later. We told you at the beginning, Ty was coming in two hours, or two and a half hours. It's been a little longer, I agree, but then come back. Um, I can't. Sum I just uh, summarized it all. Okay. Sorry. All right. So let's start with wealth and copy. Okay. A lot of people, and I'm gonna repeat this for the newcomers on live call right now. I do own three business, four businesses, so I do know a lot about business as well. I'm a neuroscientist, but I also own businesses. So you can ask me a lot of questions regarding business. And then one of the topics that I'd like to talk about is copying. And I says it too, copy from the top. Always go to the top and copy the best. And why is copy a good thing? It's because if somebody's already doing it, why are you gonna do the opposite, right? Why are you not going to copy the guy that's being successful in your field and do opposite of what he's doing? It doesn't make any sense. So what you do is you're like, and I'm not saying you need to steal, right? And, and copying, you can say it's kind of stealing, but there's ways and ways. So like, for example, we found people copying certain things from Ty 100%. There's somebody actually that was printing our t-shirts and selling them. Now that's illegal copying. What I mean by copying is, hey, Ty is doing a t-shirt and he's, talk, he's giving talks about this and doing this and doing that. I'm going to copy Ty and I'm gonna use his same techniques and I'm going to make my own t-shirt, I'm going to make my own marketing things, I'm going to make my own things. But you're copying what he's doing, but not his exact things. You people get confused sometimes and think that copying 100% is the same. It's not okay to rip off somebody else's work and try to sell it and make money for yourself. Somebody even wrote a book on the 67 steps, you know. You can't just copy the 67 steps, put it in a book and try to sell it. You know, because what happens is you get sued. Now, what you can do is come up with your own system and say, hey, I'm going to teach you the four pillar system and you write your own book, you do your own things, and that's good. It's good to copy that way. It's like, take this, the general thought of things and then copy, tweak it to, your, to what you need and then do it, okay? So, like, for example, at my adventure park, I go to all these meetings, we go and study what everybody else is doing, and I copy a lot. Like, so, 
for example, one of the trips I went to one of the, uh, the trade shows in my industry, somebody ha I went to somebody's field and I saw what they were doing and how effective they were in managing people, the throughput of people, right? So from customer to pain to getting their equipment to going to play. And I was like, that's genius the way they did it. So what I did, I went back home. We built a whole new building now that imitates exactly the same thing that this guy's doing. Because to me, that was the most effective turnkey um, way of doing it for an adventure park. And I loved it. So I copied him. Now, I didn't copy his logo. I didn't do everything exactly he was doing. But that's what I did. I copied his idea and did it on mine. And we're far away anyways. That, and then, by the way, copying people is flattering. If somebody comes and copies me something that I've done or imitates a technique that I've been using, I'm flattered because I'm like, okay, that means not only I think it's good, other people think it's good. So copying is okay. Okay? So make sure you copy legally. No infringement. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about this? <clears throat> Somebody asking if I'm active on social media. Yes, I do. I am in, I'll show you real quick. Herman Garcia Fresco is probably with a G, G-E-R-M-A-N, Garcia Fresco. You can find me with that name on Facebook and LinkedIn. And I just joined uh, Snapchat as Dr. Fresco. So you can find me in Snapchat as Dr. Fresco. Okay, so somebody said, it's all about the niche you're in, but you need to add your own styles. Yes, that is correct. You could, again, copying from the top is the best. There is a seminar that I gave, or a talk that I gave uh, at the uh, last seminar we had here in LA, and I showed people um, the logos that fast food companies use. So they use, for example, Let's, I'm going to name some and tell you the colors, or you can tell me the colors and you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> so for example, McDonald's. The logo is yellow mm -hmm. and red, right? Uh, Wendy's. Yellow and red. What other one is uh, fast food like that? Uh, uh, Burger King. Yellow and red. What color? Bojangle is red and yellow too. Bojangle. Yellow and red. So my question to you, and there's more. I had a page with like 20 of them. Huh? Oh, somebody's going to post them out on live. But my question to you is the following. If you were to do a fast food restaurant, what color would your logo be? If you don't say yellow or red, I'm going to say you're a moron. Okay, there. You guys can see... Um, well, whatever. Um, yeah, there we go. So you guys can see it. There. You guys can see... McDonald's, Wendy's, Denny's, Burger King, Pizza Hut. Uh, I don't know, Church Chicken, Golden Chicken, Hardee's, Campero, they're all red and yellow. So the question is, now there's a whole psychology of color thing. I'm not going to go into it today. Um, but that's the reason why they pick those colors. And, and, and what you have to think is this. McDonald's is a multi-million dollar company. Hardee's, Burger King, Wendy's, they're all multi-million dollar companies. You know they spend millions of dollars researching, doing their marketing to find out what's best, what attracts the most people. And they came up with red and yellow. So why would you make your logo a different color? And that's where it goes to copy from the best, right? So I guarantee you with 100% certainty that if I ever open a fast food restaurant, my colors would be red and yellow for sure because I know that's what works for them so that's what you need to do for your business <clears throat> okay next one 
follow rules. And actually, Ty has been talking about following basic rules, which is great. If you don't have any rules to follow for your business, to develop your business, a, a business plan, you're never going to get anywhere, right? If And rules can be simple. You don't have to make complicated rules for everything you make. You, the simpler they are, the better they are. And not only that, it's better for your employees. It's better for your customers if you make it simple. And what I mean by rules, I don't mean like, okay, this and this, you have to get that. Like any type of rule, whether it's the guidance on your website, you know, making your website easy enough to navigate, making your customer service line an easy place to find things, you know, where your bathrooms are, are they easy to find? These are all basic rules that you need to apply in order to be successful. If you don't apply them, or you make them complicated, how many of you hate going to a website, and I'm one of them, and you're looking for a phone, or you're looking for some piece of information that you're like, man, I can't find, and you click and click and click, and you go to one page, go to another one, they're not following rules, they're not following simple rules. Okay, they didn't, to me that person didn't even waste any time telling five people, can you go to my website and test it, see if it's okay for you. Do you have any issues finding the buy button? You know, how stupid would you be if your buy button is not easily accessible? Your buy button should be on your first page, period. You know, it should be right there. If you go look at all the top sites in the world, their buy buttons are on the first page, very easily accessible for you. And if it's not a button, it's a page tab that says buy now or buy you whatever, order now, whatever it is. Easy rules, simple, so that people can follow them and do it, okay? Jesus is here now. Who's that? Christopher Bajaras. <laughs> okay, any questions? Spice color. Uh, Herman, for writing copy, choosing images, etc., for marketing to prospective clients, which of those seven are best to hit on for food service provider and how? Wait, which seven? I don't know which seven you're talking about. Are you talking about my list? Um, um, rephrase your question again and I'll be able to answer it. Okay. Anybody else here have a question? All right, we'll move on. Okay, invest. This is very important too. Most people fail to invest in their own business. And by doing so, you can fail or come to a halt and stop. When I started the adventure park, all the money I was, now I was fortunate because I had other businesses that were giving me income, so I was able to not take any money from this business so I can grow my business. So you need to invest, and, that, and this invest is twofold, in yourself, in your business, and in your employees. Extremely important, very important. Invest in my employees, why is it important? Because the more I invest in them, so for example, I, I take my employees to trade shows for the company, right? So let's say for the adventure park, I send them to the Halloween trade show or the paintball trade show. And when I'm, they're there, I spend money, I buy classes, I pay for them so they can train, so they can learn, let's say, how to fix a paintball gun or they can learn and, uh, on how to deal with uh, birthday parties, or they can learn on how to treat customers. Everything I do is I do so they become a better employee for the company, and also it helps them, because if they ever wanna go somewhere else in the future, you know, they have, a more, they have more tools in their belt, right? I'm investing for them, for my company, and in for their future. So you want to invest in your employees. Don't be cheap, don't be, um, stingy about that, okay? Make sure you do it, um, invest in them. You want to invest, like I was telling you, in your business, because if you don't invest in your business, it's going to come to a stale halt. 
going back to my adventure park, there's a park that I used to go to. Um, hi here. Uh, there's a park that I used to go to play paintball before I started my own park that uh, I loved it. Well, it's been 12, 10 years that I've been go that I know of this place, and now I have my own and everything. I've been there last. I was there last year. Not one thing, not one thing changed in 10 years, which to me is like, oh my God, are they doing that bad that they can't invest in anything, or they just don't care anymore? When you don't care anymore, things go down the drain. So what happens is I start capturing a lot of their customers because in my place. We innovate every single year. Artie is, doesn't want to come here, but he can tell you. We are always adding stuff. Right now, next week, we're going to a Halloween trade show, which, again, I'm investing in me, in my company, and in my employees because I'm taking, like, four people there, too. And at the Halloween show, I'm interested in learning about escape rooms. If you guys don't know what an escape room is, it's uh, you should Google it and you should go. They're fun. You go to these rooms. They put you there for an hour and they give you all these clues and you're supposed to escape within an hour. And if you get out, great, you win. And the fastest you get out, you could be their number one escapee or you don't make it. I actually went to one uh, with Artie and a whole bunch of friends and we did not get out. We got stuck in there. But the point is, I'm going, so I was doing my research by going to escape rooms and then now I'm going to the, an event where they have classes on escape rooms. So I'm going to invest, I'm going to have my employees learn about it, and then I'm going to innovate and add it to my park, <clears throat> right? So I'm investing in my business. Now I could grab that twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 that I might spend on the adventure, uh, on the escape rooms, and put it in my pocket, but I choose not to, because this is, those $30,000 investment might bring me another hundred fifty, dollars right? That then I can put in my pocket. So make sure you invest. And then finally, Invest in yourself and invest in yourself with training, okay? So, for example, you guys being here, you're investing in yourself. You're learning stuff that I, most of you don't know. Now, some of you might know every single thing I've said. Great for you. But the chances are that there's always one little piece of nugget information that you're like, oh, I didn't know that. That's kind of cool to know. Ty's going to come and he's going to talk to you about a whole bunch of stuff that you probably didn't know either. So you're investing in yourself. You're taking that first step. Reading is another way of investing in yourself. So grabbing, you know, Ty is a big book fan. You want to read as much as you can. If you can't afford $10,000 programs, that's okay. Don't feel bad. Eventually you will. And eventually you'll be able to get the benefits from them. But as of right now, do at least whatever's the most basic stuff. Go to Google, research stuff, learn, you know, Inve like I said, invest in yourself. And when I say invest in yourself, yes, once in a while you can invest in yourself, like saying rewarding yourself and say, hey, I'm going to, you know, buy me a new car. I'm going to, once I do this, it's okay. I don't mean that kind of investing in yourself. I mean invest in yourself for growth, okay? So grow yourself. Does anybody have any questions about this? <clears throat> Somebody asked, is the attraction of red and yellow correlated with food or it's useful in other businesses? It's mainly it, food, it's highly effective. It, I don't know in every single business what it does, but you don't want to have a red and yellow logo if you're trying to open a dental practice or a hospital. It's, it, it, cre it's, it activates your brain, it makes you very excited, so you don't want that. So no, the colors change depending on what you want to do. So for example, if you look at all the social media icons and logos, they're all blue and green. They're calm, they're professional, they, they show trust. If you want a luxury brand, you probably want to use the color black, you know, if you're selling like a high level cigars or, or wines or whatever, like a cool watch, you use black. Um, so, and there's a whole psychology of colors that I can talk for hours, but it's not the topic today um, that I was planning to talk to in here, so you can do that. Um, but yeah, mostly it is food. Any questions about investing? Okay. Uh, uh -huh. 
do I have any advice on productivity? Like how long is too long to be writing and creating per day? You know, that depends on you. Um, again, if you want to immerse yourself, we talk about immersing yourself into business or learning or doing something, if you want to learn quick. If it's something that you need to learn fast, you want to get off the feet, uh, off the ground fast. Let's say you're like, I got no money. I, these are my last five thousand dollars I have in my bank account, and I need to make the best out of it. Well, the fastest and the longest you can spend your time trying to develop those five thousand dollars to make your money, the better, right? Now, on the other hand, it's like, do you want to do that with everything in your life? Probably not, because then, like I said, if you are a dude that works ninety hours a week you know, just invest in, and spend time and invest in yourself and yourself and you neglect your family, then you're going to fail on your family side and then you fail. And remember, you want to balance everything. You want to have balance on everything you do. You want to have balance in love and wealth, you know, a general balanced life. So you have to figure that out. Again, sometimes you might need to sacrifice one thing over another temporarily. You know, I know a guy Actually, Charlotte's, you know, you guys know Charlotte. Steven, he, um, he had to sacrifice somewhat his health, look very skinny and, and poor looking kind of person for a movie. So he did that for like two, three months, sacrificed a little bit of his health to be able to get this role in the movie to be successful, right? So, but then he comes back and rebalances his life again. And while he was sacrificing that, he was also sacrificing his relationship a little bit. Because, you know, by sacrificing his health, he's being more stressed, and then that can bring tension between a couple. So the point is, yes, sometimes it's okay to unbalance yourself when you need to, but make sure you know that you explain your partner and you regain that balance back in your life again. Okay. <clears throat> Research. Research your company. It's very important. Not your company. Research everything you're going to do. So I get a lot of people saying, oh, I'm thinking of starting a t-shirt business. I'm like, okay. Yeah, you could be successful or you could be a failure. You know, have you done research enough? Do you have any idea on how to start a, a, a company with t-shirts? Do you know how to do the marketing? Have you studied your competitors? Do you know what kind of fabric do you want to do in your t-shirts? you know the designs you want to yeah, sell for your t-shirts? Do you have a niche for your t-shirts? You know, if you don't do all that research, all basic research, you're never going to be successful. So make sure 100% you do research. I, I told a funny story at one of my seminars. So I went two weeks ago. We have, in my park, we also have zip lines. So I went to a zip line convention. And at this place, somebody was asking, it's like, oh, who here has already zip lines? Who here, la, la, la. Who here is thinking of opening zip lines? And these guys wait, you know, raise their hand. And then for some odd reason, he goes, who here is thinking of opening a zip line but has never been on a zip line? Two guys raised their hand. I'm like, oh my God. You know, it's like a zip line park is not cheap. I'm going to tell you that much. I spend $400,000 for my eight zip lines. It ain't cheap. Now, for some people, it might be pocket change. For me, it wasn't. So, do you think I'm going to all of a sudden say, here's 400000 let's do a zip line. I have no idea what it even feels to zip line. I have no idea what the competition does. No way. So, the, the guy goes, well, you two need to leave the room and go do some zip lining before, you know. I mean, he was kind of joking, but kind of serious at the same time. It's like... You're already spending money and energy and coming to these conferences and you don't even know if you like it. You don't even know if it's a business model that will work for you, right? Do your research. I see that happening a lot with people. They start, very, very clear example was uh, uh, my guy in North Carolina. He opened a restaurant and failed. I always tell the story, I'm gonna make it shorter because oh, that is about to come. But he opened a restaurant. He's never been in the restaurant business. We told him, do not open a restaurant. 
two of my buddies that own restaurants said, this location is not great and this restaurant is too big for you to handle.